Now let's look at some of the important uh, concepts regarding the currency exchange rates. So whenever we uh, bring in the exchange rate, it means we are trying to express the price of one unit of currency in terms of another. I am trying to express dollar in terms of let's say Indian rupees or I am trying to uh, express euro in terms of US dollar or I am trying to express US dollar in terms of Australian dollar. So we are trying to establish one currency in the form of other. Right? One unit of one currency is equal to how many units of another currency. And that is what we are calling as exchange rate. And what we see is in the foreign exchange markets across the world, for each exchange rate, for each currency, there is a three character code that is standardized. Like dollar, US dollar, we represent it as USD. For Japanese N, we represent it as JPY. Or uh, for Indian rupee, it is represented as INR. And Euro, EUR. Australian dollar, AOD. So we, we find some kind of a standardization in terms of the notation used for the different currencies across the world. Now, from the representation perspective, we commonly see that the representation goes like this. 63 INR per US dollar. What does it mean? 1 US dollar is worth 63 Indian rupees. This is called as a direct currency code. So, wherever we are using the word direct currency code, we have two types of quotations that we uh, commonly observe. When I say direct currency quotation, we try to exhibit the domestic currency and the foreign currency in this manner per one unit of foreign currency. So if I am saying in this case, INR is my domestic currency because in a direct currency quote, I will be writing it as per one unit of foreign currency, how many units of domestic currency is required? To buy one unit of foreign currency, how many units of domestic currency is required? So, in this case, the domestic currency is called as the price currency. I call domestic currency as the price currency and the foreign currency is called as a base. So, for one unit of base, how many units of price currency is required? is what is a direct currency quotation. So, 63 Indian rupees, which is the price currency per 1 US dollar, which is the base currency. But whenever I talk about the indirect quote, indirect quote will talk about 1 unit of domestic currency. Right? We talk about per 1 unit of domestic currency how many units of foreign currency? So, how do I get that? So, 63 Indian rupees per USD. So, if at all I have to uh, talk about uh, per 1 rupee, how many USD I am directly taking 1 by 63. So, 1 by 63 USD is the value of 1 INR. This is the indirect quote. So, 1 INR is equal to uh, uh, 0 0.01 something USD. This is coming out as the indirect code. But if you observe here, if US is the domestic currency, then this would be the direct code. If US is the domestic currency and Indian rupee is uh, the foreign currency, then it could be written as 1 by 63 USD per INR. This would be a direct quote for a person operating in US 
whereas uh, uh, this would the same would be an indirect quote for an investor in india similarly this is a direct quote for an investor in india but it would be an indirect quote for an investor in us right so the direct and indirect uh, quotes need to be comfortably understood and in most of the times we see that the exchange rate is established in nominal terms when i say it is established in uh, nominal terms there is an impact of the purchasing power in both the countries the inflation of both the countries is taken any nominal terms is the real term plus even it takes into consideration the inflation impact so the inflation differential of the countries is also taken into consideration while pricing the uh, while while expressing the exchange rate quotation so when i look at it uh, purely from a real exchange rate perspective means removing the impact of uh, inflation or the pricing uh, power, uh, relative purchasing power parity or pricing differentials between the countries the best way for me is to remove the pricing influence of the countries so take the spot exchange rate so 63 i take the spot exchange rate multiply it with the some kind of a pricing uh, index for a foreign country so i take the cpi of a foreign country if i am taking a consumer price uh, index as a measure of uh, pricing uh, power in both the countries i take the pricing power of domestic as well as the pricing uh, cpi with respect to the foreign and based on that i try to exchange the nominal uh, spot rate uh, to to arrive at the real exchange rate so it is taking into consideration the relative purchasing power of the currencies over the time so if this number is uh, increasing so uh, the, the purchasing power of the domestic currency is completely decreasing and vice versa so whenever i am seeing a real exchange rate has gone up it's a clear indication that the real purchasing power of the domestic currency has decreased and vice versa so that's where we are uh, simplifying it any exchange rate decrease so if i say using this direct quote let's say instead of 63 now the exchange rate has become 62 inr 62 per usd what does it mean One USD now is only sixty-two rupees instead of sixty-three. Means USD, the foreign currency, has weakened, or I can say the Indian currency, the domestic currency, has strengthened. So that is where we use the domestic currency has appreciated, and uh, the foreign currency has weakened or depreciated. so in case of direct exchange when i am looking at uh, and i am seeing that the number has gone down i say that the domestic currency has appreciated and the foreign currency has depreciated and uh, if i see that uh, the number has gone up it means the the weakening of the domestic currency or depreciation of the domestic currency so this kind of uh, understanding uh, between when do we call something as uh, depreciation when do we call something as appreciation we really uh, need to understand uh, by looking at the quotes typically whenever we look at the foreign exchange market it's one of the largest or it's not one of the it is the largest financial uh, market especially if i am looking at uh, the average daily turnover perspective so from volume wise from a daily turnover perspective huge trading is carrying on in this particular market there are different kinds of participants in this market we have mnc banks large mnc banks across the world who are majorly uh, into the selling of the currencies selling of different currencies we have uh, participants fund managers probably they could be a uh, simple mutual fund managers or we have hedge fund managers or any other fund managers portfolio managers investors corporations government central bank 
lot of these guys are uh, getting involved in buying of foreign currencies different kinds of foreign currencies across the world and they have different motives some of them may purchase it for hedging their uh, exposures to foreign exchange risk which means uh, they must have invested heavily in some assets abroad so their asset let's say an indian company indian company has purchased some kind of uh, has purchased some kind of uh, uh, properties let's say in us so the asset is purely exposed to the exchange rate fluctuations so if they really want if they really uh, want uh, this exchange rate to be frozen they can uh, they can uh, try to get into some kind of an instrument which can uh, which can freeze the exchange rate between us and india because for them if the exchange rate is worsening if the domestic exchange rate is if the domestic currency is depreciating they are going to get much more but if the domestic currency is appreciating they are going to get uh, much much lesser right so for those who are having uh, assets in us a depreciation of the currency is much advantageous but a depreciation but an appreciation of the currency is going to be a problem for them so uh, to mitigate their risk they try to uh, Uh, they try to uh, uh, get into the exchange rate uh, uh, transaction where they want to uh, sell dollars for a fixed amount of rupees where they want to sell dollars for a fixed amount of rupees so that uh, they are going to get uh, fixed rupees irrespective of whether the us currency has appreciated or depreciated so this is where the hedger's role is coming into picture whatever their existing exposure to the foreign uh, exchange is existing they want to mitigate that risk so they are playing the role of a hedger and in some cases we see that they play the role of speculator which means they they forecast that uh, the exchange rate uh, is going to increase or decrease so probably if they if uh, they are visualizing that uh, within 6 uh, months the usd relative to inr is going to appreciate right so right now it is 63 so what they would be uh, typically uh, doing is they will purchase the us this let's say using 6300 bucks they are going to purchase 100 usd right by 100 usd so using 6300 indian rupees now if they are uh, forecasting that uh, the usd is going to strengthen and it is going to inr 65 within 3 months or within 6 month now after 6 month they are going to sell this 100 usd and they are going to get 6500 bucks right so this is uh, the typical speculator's role he is not having any kind of exposure to any foreign exchange risk he wants to take a risk under the betting scenario that the exchange rate is going to go up or go down in the future so that's one more uh, motive because if there are some parties who are willing to reduce their risk there should be some parties who are willing to take the risk because at the end a transaction is primarily a transfer of risk from one party who does not want to take the risk to another party who is willing to take the risk right and the understanding of this foreign exchange market is very much necessary for us because uh, the entire global economy is dependent heavily on the way the foreign exchange markets uh, function because it's one of the largest markets the pricing with respect to the other markets whether it's a stock market or a bond market or a commodities market the, the the prices of the various entities with respect to these markets they are heavily dependent on the foreign exchange market so one uh, important thing for us to uh, have a good understanding of it and even from the investor standpoint their portfolio performance is heavily dependent 
on the foreign exchange market because the domestic stock prices get very badly impacted because of uh, fluctuations in the foreign exchange. So all these numbers need to be taken into consideration for uh, evaluating uh, the financial markets performance. So which means foreign exchange markets across the world play an important role in deciding the, the functioning of the global economy, pricing of the different markets and even the investors' uh, portfolios' performances, right? Now, whenever we are talking about a change in a currency, right, we talk about uh, currency as appreciated or depreciated. As I have already uh, mentioned, let's say today, the currency exchange rate is INR 63 per USD. So tomorrow it is going to INR 64 per USD. So what does it mean? USD has appreciated. So if you look at it from a base currency's perspective, the base currency has appreciated because it's a the change is positive now how do i look at it what is the percentage change i look at it as 64 minus 63 by 63 i look at it in terms of percentage so the base currency has appreciated by that much extent right uh, so otherwise i can write it if it has gone to let's say 62 per usd even then I'll write it as the base currency. If I look at it from a base currency's perspective, base currency has depreciated by this much amount or if it has gone to 64, I say that the base currency has appreciated by this much amount. So I'll simply find out the percentage change in the exchange rate and based on that, I'll say that the base currency has either appreciated or depreciated. But when I look at it with respect to price currency, now if I have to look at it with respect to Indian rupee, what I'll typically see is earlier it is 1 by 63 USD per Indian rupee. Now it has gone to 1 by 64 USD per Indian rupee. Right? Now, the percentage change is nothing but 1 by 64 minus 1 by 63 divided by 1 by 63. So, this gives me minus 1 by 63 into 64 divided by 1 by 63. So, it's coming out as minus 1 by 64%. Right, so it's not the appreciation in, so here you are seeing 1 by 63% is the appreciation of the base currency, but 1 by 64% is the depreciation of the price currency. So it is not the case that the appreciation of the price base currency is the, uh, the equal and negative uh, depreciation of uh, the price currency and vice versa. So always you invert the quote, make it uh, as uh, for one unit of domestic currency, how many units of foreign currency and based on that do the computation and see the percentage change and if it is negative, in that case it is talking about a depreciation, if it is positive, I will bring out an appreciation. So we really need to understand um, whether we are looking at uh, percentage change of the base currency or percentage change of the price currency and based on that uh, we have to make the appropriate computation because if it is a base currency it's a straightforward I take the exchange rate as it is any increase the base currency has appreciated any decrease the base currency has depreciated but when I am looking at it from the price currency's perspective, the first thing is invert the quote, make it as number of units of base currency, uh, the original base currency for one unit of price currency. So to invert the first invert the quote and after that find out the percentage change in the exchange rate and then find out the actual uh, uh, whether it is a depreciation or an appreciation and if so by what percentage right
Now, the next important point to talk about in this context is the cross currency rate. See, let's say if I have something like INR 63 per USD and I also have USD 1.5 per Euro. Now, I can very well uh, try to write 63 into 1.5 INR per Euro. Because it is uh, as good as saying 1 USD is equal to 63 INR. And uh, 1 Euro is equal to 1.5 USD. So 1 USD is 63 INR. So 1.5 USD is 1.5 into 63 INR. So the multiplication is going to tell me 1 Euro is going to be this much. This many INR. So, if I have two different, three different currencies with me and uh, three different exchange rates or two different uh, exchange rates, I can try finding out the, the, the third, the transitive relationship between the exchange rates uh, and based on that, I can try to establish uh, one currency with respect to the third. See, but at the same time, I may be uh, having, so here if I am looking at, this is uh, working out to 94.5, 94.5 INR. But it might so happen that in the exchange rate market, I might be seeing a quotation saying 92 INR per euro. Now, this is what we call as an arbitrage opportunity because when I am trying to find out this way, I am getting 94.5 INR per USD, but a direct quotation if I am seeing in the market, I am seeing 92 INR uh, per euro. Now, how will people uh, take an advantage of this? They use, okay, let's say they have 9,200 bucks. Using the 9,200 bucks, they directly buy 100 euro. They can do that? Yes, they will buy 100 euro. Now, they convert the euro into, ISD, uh, into USD. So, because they have 100 euros, they will sell the 100 euros and buy 150 US dollars. Use that 100 euros by 150 US dollars. Then use the 150 US dollars, right? You sell 150 US dollars and uh, get 63 into 150 Indian rupees. So get 9450 Indian rupees. All these transactions immediate. Now, which means without any risk, you are able to make 250 bucks profit, 250 Indian rupees as a profit, right? So, if this difference is existing and the trading is very active in all these markets, using the cross-currency rates, people try to take an advantage in terms of making the profits accordingly. So, given two exchange rates, we can very well compute the third. In some cases, some kind of inversions may be required. What does that mean? Okay, if I have INR 63 per USD and I also have, let's say, uh, uh, let's say 0 0.8, 0 0.8 uh, pounds per USD. Now I want to express Indian rupee with, with respect to USD. But what does this mean here? 1 USD equal to 63 Indian rupees. 1 USD equal to 0.8 pounds. 
So it's as good as uh, saying I I should invert this one. So one probably I can very well write it as one pound equal to one by point eight USD, making it uh, one point two five USD. And after that, it becomes more easy. One pound is one point two five USD, so I'll write it as one point two five times sixty three INR. Right. So this is where I'm trying to invert the relationship wherever required. And once I have inverted it, I am able to establish uh, the relationship between Indian rupees and pounds. So, uh, so the cross currencies will really uh, help in balancing uh, the exchange rates across the world, and trading uh, can be uh, the trading of them will uh, try to eliminate any kind of arbitrage uh, differences that can uh, exist between the various currencies across the world. Right now, here the with respect to foreign exchange rates, there are two types of markets. One is the spot spot rate or the spot market, where the buying and selling of the currencies happen immediately. So the delivery of the currency happens immediate, which is a T plus two kind of a settlement within uh, two days. The, the the entire settlement happens. The buying and selling happens in the uh, at the current exchange rate itself. But for majority of the cases, we talk about a forward exchange rate. The exchange rate for buying and selling the foreign currency at a future date, probably three months down the lane, or uh, uh, let's say first Jan first June two thousand fifteen. Right, so the the exchange rate for buying and selling the foreign currency at a future date, and that future date to a large extent is pre-agreed date. It is known as of today itself. So on that particular day, if I have to buy or sell the foreign currency, this is the particular uh, amount of domestic currency that needs to be exchanged. So this is very heavily used. We see the forex forwards, forex swaps. We see exchange rate futures. We see exchange rate options. Almost all kinds of derivative securities are typically uh, traded in uh, uh, traded uh, using this forward exchange rate mechanism. The exchange rate for some kind of uh, buying and selling for a future date. So it is used for hedging purposes. So all kinds of foreign exchange exposures can very well be handled through this, or it can be used for a speculation purpose also. And forex swaps can be created by combining it with the spot transactions. So all kinds of derivative instruments are are, are basically basing on the forward exchange rate itself. And what we see is the forward exchange rate. In some cases, it is established in terms of points, and in some cases, it is established in terms of percentage. So probably, if it says 1.5 percent, it means that the forward exchange rate, let's say three months down the lane, the exchange rate is going to be whatever is the spot rate multiplied by one plus 1.5 percent. So the forward exchange rate three months from now is going to be something like this because it is established as 1.5 percentage uh, percentage over the current spot rate. Whereas in some cases it can be established in terms of points. See, generally the forward exchange rate is a four-digit number. Let's say when I talk about uh, the Indian rupee, we can talk about it is as uh, 63. Point one two three four Indian rupee per USD. Now, when I say in the forward market, it is available at twenty five point twenty five point five points. What does that mean? When I am expressing one unit is like point zero 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 one to the exchange rate. So when I'm saying 25.5, it is as good as the forward exchange rate is going to be 63.1234 plus 
plus 25.5, taking it to 63.12595. Right? Or 63.12595. So this is what uh, is the typical uh, quotation uh, mechanism, right? Added to the spot rate to compute the forward rate. One unit is equivalent to 0 0.0001 addition to the exchange rate. So what we typically see is the forward rate is majorly dependent on the spot rate. The time period of the contract, the longer the time period is, the higher is the uh, points. So there is a direct, almost a proportionality kind of a relationship, direct proportion uh, between uh, the time period and the forward rate points. And also the interest rate differential, because uh, if we are quoting it in nominal terms, the inflation differential, the inflation differential again is coming up from the interest rate differentials between both the countries. And uh, just to establish a relationship, we see that the forward rate is generally spot rate into 1 plus the uh, interest rate in the domestic divided by 1 plus the interest rate in the foreign currency. So what we typically see if the domestic interest rates are much much lesser Right? If the domestic interest rates are much, much lesser compared to the foreign, we see that the exchange rate is going to be lesser and there is going to be a, uh, an appreciation of the domestic currency because the exchange rate is going to fall. The domestic currency is going to appreciate. But if the interest rates are in the domestic currency are much higher compared to that of a foreign currency, we see that the forward rate is going to be much higher, which means there is going to be an appreciation of the foreign currency or a depreciation of a domestic currency. So that is how we can, just by looking at the foreign uh, forward code, depending on whether it is positive or negative, we can very well expect whether it is, uh, whether the domestic currency uh, is going to appreciate in the future or depreciate in the future. So this is what I was talking of, the forward rate, I'll take it as the spot rate multiplied by 1 plus domestic currencies risk-free rate or the risk-free interest rate divided by 1 plus foreign currencies risk-free rate of return. Or the other way of talking about is spot rate multiplied by 1 plus the interest rate in the price currency. Price currency generally is the domestic currency in case of direct quote. Right, so 1 plus the uh, interest rate in the price currency divided by 1 plus interest rate in the base currency. So this is how we denote the forward rate. And uh, if the forward rate, this equation is not getting satisfied, then it is going to give rise to an arbitrage opportunity. Let's try to look at one example. Today, we'll, we'll take, uh, okay, INR 60 per 1 USD, right, 60 rupees per Indian dollar, so, sorry, 60 uh, Indian rupees per 1 US dollar. Let's say the forward exchange rate, one year, one year later, the forward rate in the forward market, let's say I'm looking at INR 65 per USD. And this is a one year forward, right? And let us say that the interest rates, so INR interest rate is 9% or 8%. USD interest rate, let's say is 2%. Now let's uh, look at the relationship. The forward rate as per my calculation should be the spot rate which is 60 into 1 plus domestic 1.08 divided by 1 plus foreign. 
So it should be 60 multiplied by 1.08 divided by 1.02. Okay, 60 multiplied by 1.08 divided by 1.02, giving me 63.5294. Okay, 63.5294. So, this should be the forward rate. But what we are saying, uh, this should be as per the theoretical relation. But in the market, the forward rate is available for 65 per 1 US dollar. Now, how does the, that help me out, that information? This is where these two are not equal. The forward uh, rate quoted in the forward uh, exchange, forward market versus the theoretical forward rate computed based on the spot rate and the domestic uh, interest rate and the interest rate differentials between the two countries. So this is giving rise to an arbitrage opportunity. So what I typically do is I'll sell the forward contract. Okay, sell the forward means at after one year, after one year, I will sell, after one year, I will sell one dollar per 65 INR. So, right now, I will buy dollars. So, today, what do I do? I will buy dollars. So, borrow. So, let's look at borrow in rupees. How much should I borrow? Let's say because the current exchange rate is 60, let me say I am borrowing 60,000 Indian rupees. Right? So, I will say borrow 60,000 Indian rupees at 8% because the current interest rate in India is 8%. So, I will try to borrow 60,000 Indian rupees today. Which means uh, at the end of one year, how much should I pay to the bank? Because uh, I have borrowed it at 8%, I have to pay 60,000 into 1.08 to the bank in India. So, 64,800 need to be paid. But before that, the transaction that I will be doing is use that 60,000 bucks and purchase or buy $100 or $1,000. Because right now the dollar is available at 60. Right now the dollar is available at 60 Indian rupees. So I will buy $1000 for that. And I will invest that $1000 for one year. And because the interest rate is, uh, uh, is 2%, I am going to get at the end of one year, I am going to get one zero two zero dollars. But because I have sold the exchange rate, I have sold dollar, uh, I would be uh, able to sell dollar for sixty five Indian rupees. At the end of in at the end of the year, I will convert this one thousand twenty dollars into sixty five, and I will be receiving sixty six thousand three hundred. So, I will pay back 64,800 and I am left with 1,500 solid after paying back. Which means, in a way, if I look at that 60,000 investment has resulted in 66,300 for me. Which means it has given me 10.5% return uh, without any additional risk. I am able to create an arbitrage profit. So, that is what will happen. We will start borrowing in one currency, whichever is the cheaper in the spot market. Right? So, uh, compared to uh, the forward market, I am finding that uh, in, the, in, in the current spot market, uh, I could buy dollars. So, I will borrow in rupees and I will try to buy the dollars. And uh, in the dollars only, I will do the investment. I will receive the proceeds at the end of the year in dollars. And at the forward rate, because we have already sold the forward uh, contract, we can sell dollars at uh, 65 bucks per uh, 65 Indian rupees per one dollar, 
at uh, at uh, after one year so at that point using the forward rate i am going to convert it back to the uh, to the indian rupee and there is a, a huge amount that is left apart from paying back the loan amount so that is what is my profit without taking any additional risk so this is an important relationship right but in reality people will believe that the spot rates are unbiased predictors for the forward rates but in reality we may or may not encounter this relationship in some cases it could be forward rate could be much higher compared to this equation or it could be much lesser because in general forward rates are just not dependent on the spot rates right okay now we can talk about uh, the forward discount or premium when i have to use the word this particular currency is traded at a forward premium or a forward discount when i am looking at it uh, from the price currency perspective look at it like this inr 63 per usd so base currency price currency now when i say that the forward is plus 25.5 points it means that the forward rate is going to be 63.0025 right this is going to be uh, the inr in the future so because uh, it is going to be higher we say that it is a premium from the base currency's perspective it is a discount from the price currency's perspective similarly when i am looking at uh, this as negative either in the percentage terms or in the absolute terms if it is negative then it is being clearly seen as a premium for the price currency and discount for the base currency and as we have uh, seen earlier s not which is the spot exchange rate multiplied by 1 plus interest rate in the domestic currency divided by 1 plus interest rate in the foreign currency now if the interest rate of the domestic is higher compared to the foreign the exchange rate is going to go up right if the domestic interest rate is higher compared to the foreign currency then the exchange rate Uh, in the future is going to go up which means uh, there would be a positive in the uh, uh, there would be a positive in uh, the forward rate in the forward points and positive means the base currency would be uh, traded uh, at a premium and uh, the uh, price currency would be at a forward discount right so these kind of relationships also uh, needs to be comfortably uh, looked at then see all these are the different calculations of the exchange rates but one thing we have to keep in mind is almost the central banks of every country whether it is rbi in india reserve bank of india or whether it is the fed in us any of the central banks they are managing the exchange rates they play an important role in some countries in terms of uh, in terms of working on the exchange rate they take care of uh, see, making sure that the exchange rate uh, is under control so whatever are the actions that are taken up by the uh, by the central banks of different countries we call them as the exchange rate regimes now what we typically uh, see is for countries some countries they don't have their own currency then there is a different exchange rate regime that is being followed by the central bank of that country and in some countries which have their own currency again different kinds of uh, steps are being taken care by the central bank of their currency of their country now look at uh, the countries without their own currency there could be a dollarization wherein uh, we use the currency of another country straight forward so all the transactions happen let's say in us dollars for a country abc right so that is what we call as dollarization 
and in some countries the same common currency is used for various different countries which is uh, directly called as a monetary union we see euro as a monetary union each country separately does not have uh, a currency of its own there are a lot of countries which are using euro as the common currency so the countries without their own currency they can uh, either uh, go into a dollarization where they can adopt one currency as their currency and at the same time that can be extended to a group of countries uh, which come together to form a monetary union but for the countries which have their own currency there could be different kinds of arrangements for uh, plan for playing for uh, handling the exchange rates there could be a currency board which talks about it's a fixed exchange rate agreement okay if, uh, if let's say india versus uh, us dollar indian rupee versus uh, us dollar is going uh, let's say it is uh, in a currency board arrangement we are freezing the exchange rate for a specific range of a foreign currency for us dollar the the uh, central bank of india and us they are going to freeze the exchange rate between the two or the exchange rate uh, in indian uh, uh, central bank it is going to uh, uh, it is going to uh, take up uh, those kind of monetary policies which always keep indian rupee at a fixed level with respect to the us dollar so the buying and selling of the currencies happen accordingly to fix the exchange rate between the indian rupee and the us dollar that's a currency board arrangement in some cases it could be a slight zone of variation being provided that is called as a fixed parity the interest rates uh, the exchange rates are allowed to fluctuate within 1% range between the two currencies so let's say if the exchange rate between india and us is 60 so 1% uh, here and there so probably as long as it is uh, between 59.4 and 60.6 no actions are taken but the moment uh, the value is going below this or above this the, the government is going to interfere and uh, it will try to bring the exchange rate within this uh, range itself that is called as a fixed parity kind of an adjustment then some countries follow a target zone kind of an adjustment uh, probably wherein the 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 targets are slightly more wider the allowable range for each of the currencies the the fluctuation range is slightly more probably they may say 2% or 3% range so as long as the exchange rate is fluctuating within that range no actions are taken that is what we call as the target zone then we also bring out the crawling band the exchange rate right without any kind of a target like this okay it should be between 2% and 3% variation instead of looking at it from that perspective it is looked at as a variable wherein there is a periodic adjustment that is done based on the inflation levels it's not a target of fixed 2% 3% depending on the inflation levels the bands can change over time so it's getting managed the exchange rates are managed wherein the bands keep changing over time based on the inflation levels there could be some kind of adjustments that can happen to that particular the uh, uh, allowable fluctuation percentages then some countries could follow a managed float the rates are purely based on various economic indicators the balance of payments the inflation rates the employment level so the rates are even uh, uh, the, the fluctuation permitted fluctuation levels are decided uh, on a timely basis at different points in time different numbers being worked out and they do not target any specific exchange rate and in some countries there could be an independently a floating kind of a regime where the government interferes very rarely the central bank interferes very rarely the exchange rate is completely market determined it is allowed to float only when things are completely out of control occasionally the central bank can intervene 
in terms of uh, playing with the exchange rate but in general the central bank uh, allows the market to typically uh, typically uh, adjust the exchange rate uh, based on uh, uh, based on very uh, based on uh, the market uh, fluctuations so it is completely a floating kind of uh, mechanism like the, the the central uh, bank does not uh, try to freeze it does not uh, implement a monetary policy to freeze the exchange rate or to keep the exchange rate within a particular interval so these are the different kinds of exchange rate regimes that we observe across the world see whenever we are talking about uh, an ideal regime we see that the exchange rate between the two currencies should be more or less fixed with a large amount of credibility it can't be a virtual fixation but there should be a lot of credibility attached to it means there should be a, a, a logical uh, Uh, logical uh, 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 intention behind freezing of uh, the exchange rate between the currencies all the currencies need to be fully convertible and each country at the same time it should be able to implement an independent monetary policy based on its own targets like growth inflation etc which means i could see that there is a lot of inconsistency between these two on one side we are saying an independent monetary policy which is purely targeted towards growth rate and inflation and at the same time we are saying the currency exchange rate to be fixed so these two can't go together so probably uh, uh, that is where uh, the, the the regime is can differ across the countries because uh, implementing all of them in one single regime is going to be a very difficult thing to implement because of the inconsistency between the regimes and the way the different countries uh, operate uh, as a part of their trade and business right now just trying to recollect uh, a few things relating to the trial balance and the capital account the trade balance and the capital account we know that the trade surplus that comes out surplus in the trade is matched with the deficit in the capital account the deficit in the trade should be uh, matched with uh, the surplus in the capital account and vice versa right because uh, we should uh, typically uh, see that the trade balance plus capital account balance should be equal to zero so if the trade balance is negative then probably uh, the equal and opposite capital account balance should be there so there should be a surplus in the capital account and vice versa so any factor that is affecting the trade balance will have equal and opposite effect on the uh, on the capital account so whenever we are talking about a trade surplus right we can very well infer that the domestic saving is greater than the investment spending and whenever we are seeing a, a trade deficit it is the other way investment spending is greater than the domestic savings so the domestic savings are much lesser so but the sp investment spendings are much higher so if the investment spending is much higher the external financing is required right because spending is more than the saving so the external financing needs to be required and that is what comes in the form of borrowing from the foreigners so from the, the foreign markets we are going to borrow or we are going to sell the assets to the foreigners that is when the trade deficit uh, is going to uh, come out and the trade deficit clearly uh, indicates that the spending is more than the domestic saving and how do i really evaluate the impact of the exchange rates on the international trade and the capital flows so here we discuss uh, about the two kinds of approaches one being the elasticity approach where i am looking at the elasticities of the imports as well as the exports so which is again clearly dependent on the pricing of the domestic goods and the foreign goods see in the domestic if they are cheaper and foreign goods are costlier obviously there is a lot of move towards the domestic market so it clearly takes into account 
at what rate the prices of a basket of goods are changing in the domestic market versus the foreign market. So it is a clear indication of the pricing in each of the markets and uh, that talks about the composition of the spending. If the domestic prices are going up and up, probably the spending levels are going down and down in the domestic market. And uh, when I'm going with the elasticities approach, we see that the Marshall learner condition needs to be met, which clearly says that the weightage of exports multiplied by the elasticity of exports plus weightage of imports multiplied by elasticity of imports minus one should be greater than zero in case a domestic currency is depreciating. That is what uh, will lead to a trade surplus being created or trade deficit being reduced. So it's a clear condition which talks about the combination of the export elasticity and import demand elasticity. So which should lead to a condition that the depreciation of the domestic currency will lead to a trade surplus. Because if the, if the domestic currency is depreciating, okay, let me take INR 63 currently per USD. Now let's say it is going to INR 65 per USD. See, now my exports, which I price in US dollars or Indian rupees. If I am pricing my exports in uh, Indian rupees, then I am receiving very few dollars lesser number of dollars are coming but if I am looking at my imports which are priced in the US dollars I am paying much much higher. So the proportion the weightage that I put on exports versus the imports now imports are becoming very costlier if I am going for a domestic currency depreciation the exports are becoming cheaper the imports are becoming costlier and my combination of export and imports need to be uh, in such a way that the weighted average of the exports multiplied by the elasticity of exports plus weighted average of uh, the imports, weightage of imports multiplied by elasticity of imports minus one should be a positive number which will definitely, which should lead towards a trade surplus, not a trade deficit. Because the demand for imports and exports is always price sensitive. So, whenever the relative price increase for imports, if, the, if there is a depreciation in the domestic currency, obviously the imports are becoming uh, much costlier. So, the difference between the export receipts and the import expenditure is typically going up because imports are becoming more and more costlier the exports are becoming more and more cheaper, the difference is typically growing up. So we have to uh, manage the exchange rate so that Marshall Learner condition is more or less uh, applicable. Then we can look at uh, a different scenario which is an absorption based approach which always targets the impact of the exchange rate on the overall country's expenditure and saving decisions. See, whenever I look at the domestic expenditure versus the domestic income, there should be a decrease in the expenditure. Probably if we are seeing, let's say the country is having excess capacity, right? It, it still can produce more and more. By depreciation, what is happening? Imports are becoming very, very costlier. So, uh, uh, instead of importing, we try to produce internally. So there is a demand for the domestic produced goods uh, coming up because imports become very, very expensive. So a depreciation in the currency can increase the demand for the domestic goods. So because of that, the domestic uh, expenditure is, uh, is uh, going lesser compared to domestic income. Domestic income is increasing because there is a demand for the domestic goods being produced. So this is what will uh, try to increase the trade surplus or reduce the trade deficit. And at the same time, another thing that needs to come out is domestic savings must increase relative to the domestic investment. Savings should cross the investment because if the investments are more than the savings, as we have discussed earlier, 
uh, there should be a surplus funding that needs to come. The funding should come from the foreign market, either the loans from abroad or typically selling the assets to the foreigners will happen. So look at this. If the country is operating at a full employment level, let's say, the depreciation should decrease the domestic expenditure also because the purchasing power parity is going to uh, go down. The prices are going to go up. So the, the domestic expenditure is going to go down. And uh, that is created uh, purely because of the wealth effect. Purchasing power of the domestic currency denominator assets is going down. We are not able to afford them. So people say, why to buy those? Let's save. Saving is uh, uh, is happening and the expenditure is getting reduced. So exchange rates play a very important role on the international trade and the capital flows, which can very clearly be understood by both these approaches. So that's how uh, the impact of the exchange rates, the impact of the currency, uh, uh, currency, uh, 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 currency uh, exchange rate uh, between the various countries play an important uh, role from the understanding standpoint and we really need to be uh, comfortable in getting a good uh, hold on the understanding of the exchange rates, how they are determined, how they are traded, what kind of influence they have on international trade and capital flows, right?